Hello, I'm Pastor Gillespie from St. John Evangelical Lutheran Church and School, Sherman Center, Random Lake, Wisconsin. It's good to have you with us here for the Congregation at Prayer, a guide for daily meditation and prayer around God's Word. It is Thursday, January 4th, 2024. And our catechesis today will continue in Matthew's account of the post-infancy narratives, the baby Jesus narratives, um, with the uh, terrible story of the slaughter of the innocents, and then the return from Egypt. Uh, we actually heard the slaughter of the innocents as our um, gospel text for last Wednesday evening at the Feast of the Holy Innocents. Um, so we'll dig in a little bit deeper than what we did there. And um, what else? And then also the return from Egypt. Uh, I don't think we spent too much time on. So no duplication here. Just, uh, well, if we hear the same account uh, each time, I try to present it from a little different perspective for you. All right. So, let's begin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's say our psalm together. I will sing of the steadfast love of the Lord forever. With my mouth I will make known your faithfulness to all generations. For I said, Steadfast love will be built up forever. In the heavens you will establish your faithfulness. You have said, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to David my servant. I will establish your offspring forever and build your throne for all generations. Let the heavens praise your wonders, O Lord, your faithfulness and the assembly of the holy ones. For who in the skies can be compared to the Lord? Who among the heavenly beings is like the Lord, a God greatly to be feared in the counsel of the holy ones and awesome above all who are around him? O Lord, God of hosts, who as mighty as you are, O Lord, with your faithfulness all around you. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. All right, our verse is from Galatians chapter 5. The flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. Galatians 5 verse 17. Okay, and then our catechism for the week, Lord's Prayer, fifth petition, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. What does this mean? We pray in this petition that our Father in heaven would not look at our sins or deny our prayer because of them. We are neither worthy of the things for which we pray, nor have we deserved them. But we ask that he would give them all to us by grace, for we daily sin much and surely deserve nothing but punishment. So we too will sincerely forgive and gladly do good to those who sin against us. And the sixth petition. And lead us not into temptation. What does this mean? God tempts no one. We pray in this petition that God would guard and keep us so that the devil, the world, and our sinful nature may not deceive us or mislead us into false belief, despair, and other great shame and vice. Although we are attacked by these things, we pray that we may finally overcome them and win the victory. All right. You might apply this uh, to Herod in particular. Herod being one who is, of course, tempted by his own sinful nature and by um, the way of this world, which, of course, is um, power exercised without authority, and then also, um, of course, the temptations of the devil, who leads us to reject God's word, namely to sin. And in case of Herod, a murderous rage. Right? Um, shame and vice describes his life as well. All right. No forgiveness of sins, by the way, is is also the description. Um, I was listening to a podcast about um, the theologian Karl Barth. You might have heard of him. He was a Reformed theologian. 
at the time, um, well, he rose up before the the um, the Nazi regime came up in Germany. He was teaching in Germany, but since he was Swiss, he ended up back in Switzerland, um, even though he was part of the Confessing um, Church and partly um, one of the authors of the uh, Barman Declaration, uh, which said that um, resistance uh, to Nazism uh, was compelled by by our faith, of course. Um, and anyway, towards the end of his life, or, or after, I should say, the the war ended, um, he said something interesting. To, to his own Swiss people, he said that they needed to learn to forgive. And then, um, but then he traveled to, back to Germany and he said to the Germans that they um, needed to learn to repent, to confess their sins. Isn't that interesting? So to those who were sinned against, he, he compelled them to learn to forgive, um, in, you know, according to Christ. And then to those who had sinned, who had followed after a murderous regime, um, he certainly had forgiveness for them, um, but for them, it was repentance for the forgiveness of sins. It's interesting because uh, we often think that God's word doesn't apply to secular affairs. Mm -hmm. That it is kind of a spiritual discipline that, that's given out in the church. But uh, I've suggested to you that um, the most profound way to proclaim the gospel to one another is to forgive not just here in the church, not just fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, but in your family and in your workplace and in your community, is to actually confess when you've sinned and, and ask for forgiveness in Jesus' name, but also for those who have sinned against you, um, to forgive them in Jesus' name, even your enemies. And that's truly um, life-changing and also um, world-changing, right? Why? Because it's the gospel being proclaimed into the world. Uh, so we think the gospel is simply like Jesus died for 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 sins. Well, that's true, um, but how is that for you, right? So now let's proclaim it to one another. Mm, that's certainly absent in the uh, the story uh, with Herod. It seems Herod and his family um, have no such faith that forgiveness of sins um, is theirs and also to be proclaimed. Right? That's how we know that Herod was an imposter um, because he. He sees the sacrificial system as something other than for, for forgiveness of sins. All right. First reading here is going to be from Jeremiah 31. This is going to come to play um, because it's going to be quoted explicitly by Matthew. Uh, but here we're going to get a broader context, and I think that will be helpful for, for us as we discuss uh, the slaughter of the innocents. So Jeremiah 31 by the way, this is while uh, Jeremiah is sleeping, all right? Hear the word of the Lord, O nations, and declare it to the isles afar off, and say, He who scattered Israel will gather him, and keep him as a shepherd does his flock. For the Lord has redeemed Jacob, and ransomed him from the hand of one stronger than he. Therefore they shall come and sing in the height of Zion, streaming to the goodness of the Lord, for wheat and new wine and oil for the young of the flock and the herd, their souls shall be like well-watered garden, and their sorrow shall be, or shall no more. They shall sorrow no more at all. Excuse me. Then shall the virgin rejoice in the dance, and the young men and the old together. For I will turn their mourning to joy, will comfort them, and make them rejoice rather than sorrow. I will satiate the soul of the priest with abundance, and my people shall be satisfied with my goodness, says the Lord. Thus says the Lord. A voice was heard in Rama, lamentation and bitter weeping, Rachel weeping for her children because, or refusing to be comforted for her children because they are no more. Thus says the Lord, refrain your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears, for your work shall be rewarded, says the Lord, and they shall come back from the land of the enemy. There is hope for your, in your future, says the Lord, that your children shall come back to their own border. Right, so we have here Jeremiah um, given a prophetic vision um, while he was sleeping, and the vision in particular is offering comfort that the Lord has redeemed Jacob, right? So Jacob being the husband of, of Rachel, um, and ransomed him from one or by one or no, from one stronger than he. Right, we have that um, also ransomed from the one stronger than he, right up here. All right. 
Uh, it's not just Esau, but it's, I think, Egypt ultimately. All right. So we'll have the uh, slaughter of the innocents, Rachel weeping for her children. Um, but even amidst, amidst that, there is the sign here of the virgin rejoicing, a woman encompassing a man. Right? Isn't that in here? Uh, that actually comes later, 21, 22. Um, as a sign of the Lord's redemption. So even as we'll hear the weeping and lamentation of the women of of Bethlehem and Judah and Judea, um, notice here, just like with Rachel, so also uh, with them, that God will restore their children to them in the resurrection. Ultimately, uh, in Rachel's case, of course, the the her sons will return from Egypt. Um, Jacob or Joseph will be buried in Egypt, of course, his bones. Um, and of course, she'll see them all in the resurrection. In that well-watered garden where, where they shall sorrow no more at all. You know, there's a lot more that could be said about that text from Jeremiah. Maybe someday we'll read through Jeremiah. It's a little less difficult than Ezekiel, um, but we probably need to take a break from prophetic book for a while after we finish Ezekiel. Now a little over a year into it. All right. And then our reading for catechesis is from Matthew chapter 2, picking up where we left off yesterday in verse 16. Then Herod, when he saw that he was deceived by the wise men, was exceedingly angry, and he sent forth and put to death all the male children who were in Bethlehem and in all its districts, from two years old and under, according to the time which he had determined from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, a voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation, weeping, and great mourning. Rachel re- weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted because they are no more. Now, when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise, take the young child with his mother, and go to the land of Israel. For those who sought the young child's life are dead. Then he arose, took the young child and his mother, and came into the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea instead of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there, and, being warned by God in a dream, he turned aside into the region of Galilee, and he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophets. He shall be called Nazarene. Okay. So, uh, actually quite a bit here to consider. So Herod uh, orders the slaughter of the baby boys two years old and under. Why? Hmm. Uh, He realizes that he's been outwitted by, uh, really ultimately, the Lord, but by the wise men, uh, and would not be led to the child. So uh, since he doesn't know which child it is, then Herod gives orders to kill all the baby boys in Bethlehem and the vicinity. All right. Um. When also were all the firstborn males not killed? Oh, firstborn males not killed. That would be back in Egypt at the Passover. So we have um, we have an echo of the Passover, and we'll get echoes of Moses too. Name two Old Testament births near Jerusalem, or excuse me, near Bethlehem. Bethlehem's an important city. We have, uh, of course, as you mentioned, Rachel with Benjamin born there, Benjamin, and. Uh, Genesis 3, uh, 35, I should say. And then also you'll hear the birth of, of Obed, the father of Jesse, uh, who would be the father of David. So the grandfather of David born uh, to Ruth and Boaz. That's in Ruth chapter 4. So both of those uh, Old Testament stories are critical, I think, to understanding the birth of Christ. All right. Uh, what happened at the birth of Benjamin, or ben Of course, Rachel died. Um, in childbirth, Rachel had called him um, Ben Oni, Ben Oni, meaning son of my affliction or son of affliction. Um, then, but Jacob or Israel had called him Ben Hamin, meaning son of my right hand. So here, life came out of death, just as the true son of the right hand would bring life to the sons of men, just as with Rachel. All right. So then we have the quote from Jeremiah, which we heard, Jeremiah thirty-five. Um, here again, we have that connection to. You know, what we said yesterday, where Matthew quotes a brief text, he wants you, I think, to think of the bigger context. So, yes, it's it's Rachel, 
prototypical Rachel here, the women of Bethlehem and the surrounding region weeping over their children with lamentation and great mourning, refusing to be comforted. But Jeremiah prophetically had spoken of this, so it's being fulfilled. And along with the fulfillment of the weeping and lamentation, of course, is the promise of redemption and restoration and resurrection. So again, uh, when you see a quote, go and, and read the broader context. All right. um, part of that that we didn't read just a minute ago, I think is also, I'm, I referred to it, but I think we should probably share it. Listen to this part too. I have surely heard Ephraim bemoaning himself. You have chastised me and I was chastised like an untrained bull. Restore me and I will return for you are the Lord my God. Surely after my turning, I repented and after I was instructed, I struck myself on the thigh. I was ashamed yet even humiliated because I bore the reproach of my youth. Is Ephraim my dear son? Is he a pleasant child? For though I spoke against him, I earnestly remember him still. Therefore my heart yearns for him. I will surely have mercy on him, says the Lord. Set up signposts, make landmarks, set your heart toward the highway, the way in which you went. Turn back, O virgin of Israel, turn back from those cities. How long will you gad about, O you backsliding daughter? For the Lord has created a new thing in the earth, a woman shall encompass a man. Huh. Isn't that something? Yeah. So there's the promise of uh, the virgin birth again, the virgin of Israel encompassing the man. That is Christ. All right. Uh, how did Joseph know it was time to go back? Of course. Uh, not surprising with Joseph's having dreams, right? <laughs> this doesn't surprise us. Uh, it appeared to him in a dream and told him to go back. All right. Um, how did Old Testament Joseph return to Canaan? Uh, he went by a different way. Yeah, he died. Old Joseph died in Egypt. and uh, But he did make the sons of Israel swear an oath that he would return his bones back to Canaan uh, with them. And so um, after the Passover, he was carried out of Egypt. You see that in Exodus 13. There's just this incidental little note. Oh, yes, by the way, we also took the bones of Joseph with us. All right. Um, who had led Israel from Egypt to Canaan? You might think it's a Moses story, but how about an angel again? Right? It's the angel of the Lord who went ahead of Israel in the pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night to give them light. All right. Um, now, Joseph here, lots of echoes of that uh, Exodus story. Joseph was warned in a dream not to go back to Bethlehem. And so he takes him back to Nazareth, which is where we started in Matthew. Remember? Uh, they went from Nazareth down to Bethlehem for the census. All right. Well, that's actually in Luke's gospel, but okay. Um, and then it says, he was he shall be called a Nazarene. We've talked about this before. Um, there isn't probably a direct quotation here. I like the idea that it's Nazir, that is the, the, um, the branch. And that would be a reference then to um, uh, Isaiah chapter 11 and 14. Um, also, Jesus is described as the uh, the branch that is our righteousness in Jeremiah uh, 33, the Lord our righteousness, right? Um, some have said this is a, like the Nazarite, like a vow, like Samson. Eh, I could probably go with that too. Christ being kind of the inverse of the type of Samson, the anti-type. All right. So, uh, despite the tragedy and the the terrible drama of the story. You know, with that quote from Jeremiah, he wants you to think bigger and to think about how God is using even the evil that uh, Herod intends against uh, Jesus uh, actually to bring about the greatest good, to actually save the people, including those innocents who died, of course, which we heard last week. Matthew paints for us a picture of the one who is the new Moses, the savior of his people, Israel. Just as Judah and his brothers had intended evil for Joseph, so now Judah's descendants in the person of Herod were desiring evil for Joseph and Jesus. Once Egypt had attempted to destroy the line of the promise, but now Egypt was protecting the infant Christ who came to save Egypt and all the nations of the earth. Even this evil from Herod would be for good, as Jesus would turn their sorrow into joy through the work of his death and resurrection. He is the righteous branch, the Nazarene, who rose up to overthrow the abominable branch who was named Lucifer. All right. Um, I think it's a good day to actually do a little bit of a study on the hymn before we sing. 
So let me grab my reference. This is the uh, this was a gift to me I think a couple years ago from my mother. Yeah, Lutheran service book companion to the hymns. It's a significant volume, <laughs> um, and it's it was a long time coming. I waited ten years for this. I uh, wanted it for most of my ministry, but it hadn't been available yet. Um, but thank God it's available now. All right, so um, Nicholas Herrmann, fifteen hundred to sixty one, was cantor and master of Latin at. Joachim Thal, and was noted for embodying the preaching of his pastor, Johann Mathesius, a close confidant of Luther, in hymns for the people, primarily for the boys and girls of his school. So it was written for the school. Um, and you can catch that because it has the repetition uh, in the brief stanzas, right? This hymn, Love Gott, ihr Christen alle gleich, was first published around 1550 to 1555 in a set of three Christmas hymns Hermann wrote for the children he taught at Joachimsthal. All right. And lots of Lutheran um, Lutheran themes, I think, throughout the hymn, um, and which is one of the reasons why it's so notable. Uh, for example, listen to what Luther has to say about the Great Exchange. That's the uh, stanza four. How is it possible for us not to be participants in all the benefits of Christ? Christ himself has all that belongs to him from the same spirit. So it happens through the inestimable riches of the mercies of God the Father that a Christian can be glorified with Christ and can with confidence claim all things in Christ. Righteousness, strength, patience, humility, even all the merits of Christ are his through the unity of the Spirit by faith in him. All his sins are no longer his, but through the same unity with Christ, everything is swallowed up in him. And this is the confidence that Christians have and our real joy of conscience, that by means uh, of faith, our sins become no longer ours, but Christ's, upon whom God placed the sins of all of us. He took upon himself our sins. See Isaiah 53, 12. Christ himself is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. All the righteousness of Christ becomes ours. Right? And that's from Luther's uh, explanation to the 95 Theses, so that great exchange. By the way, there's some stanzas missing. I know you think, oh no, seven stanzas, so long. Well, there's two more. Um, and they were in um, the Lutheran hymnal, um, 1941. So it used to be nine stanzas for us. Um, listen to the two that uh, were left out. He nestles at his mother's breast, receives her tender care, whom angels hail with joy most blessed, King David's royal heir. King David's royal heir. Tis he who in these latter days from Judah's tribe should come, by whom the Father should upraise the church, his Christendom. The church, his Christendom. All right. Uh, and then to the tune. You might like the tune. It's also written by Herman. Uh, like Martin Luther, wrote both texts and tunes for his hymns. This tune did double duty, with Herman also using it to set a text for children about the life of St. John the Baptist. Home terror, ihr Liebsten, Schwesterlein. Uh, because the publication date of Let All Together Praise Our God is only an estimate, it's unclear for which text the tune was originally written. Uh, Fred Precht noted, this is a good example of tone painting. To appreciate the technique, one must go back to the original German text, the first two lines of which are read, Lob Gott in her Christen alle gleich in seinem hochsten Throne. Notice the leap of a fifth on the opening Lob Gott and the emphasis given to the word Allah on the sixth tone. Also, the return to the sixth tone on the word Hoxton, the tone that serves as the pitch height accent to the entire melody. Okay, thanks, Fred. Hopefully that made some sense to you. In almost every stanza, the ideas that seem most wonderful are emphasized with the high points of the tune. For example, um, in stanza two, Er kommt aus seines Vaters Schoss und wird in Kindlein Klein. He comes out of his father's bosom and becomes a little child. The high point on father, fathers, and kinline child emphasize the wonder of the incarnation of the birth of Christ. Father and infant. All right. Um, you can sing it up. Oh, you can sing it down a half step um, as E flat major instead of an F major. Uh, but that's only in the 
accompaniment edition. I've been singing in E flat all week, actually. <laughs> all right, but we'll sing it enough. Yeah, uh, tone painting. This is important. You might have note, uh, noted, um, you know, uh, I think quality musicians uh, recognize this. Um, I've taught Ethan in part, um, and his teachers as well have complimented that um, to even adjust the either the harmonization or the um, the registration of the of the organ, for example, to emphasize the text. So you'll notice, like when we sing about the unity of God the Father and the Son, or, or our unity with Christ. Um, Ethan will, in particular, go to like a unison voice, right? So there's ways to do that, and uh, to music is meant to complement the text, not the other way around. The music isn't the master; the text is the master, all right? But the music then, um, Luther would say, carries the t the text into our hearts. All right. So let's sing a few stanzas of this. What did we sing yesterday? One, two, three, I think. So how about today? Let's sing four through seven. No commemoration today, so let's continue with prayer. O God, our Maker and Redeemer, you wonderfully created us and in the incarnation of your Son, yet more wondrously, restored our human nature. Grant that we may ever be alive in him who made himself to be like us. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Heavenly Father, lead us out of temptation, guard and keep us so that the devil, the world, and our sinful nature may not deceive us or mislead us into false belief, despair, and other great shame and vice. Although we are attacked by these things, we pray that we may finally overcome them and win the victory. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We pray this day for the church and their pastors, for missionaries, teachers, deaconesses, musicians, and other servants of Christ in his church, for the fruitful and salutary use of the blessed sacrament of the Lord's body and blood. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. We pray this day in Thanksgiving with Blair, who celebrates her birthday. We pray for the households of our church, especially that of Paul, James and Deborah, Robert, Shannon, Maureen, and Clarence and Linda. Pray for our catechumens. 
Pray for those ill receiving treatment or recovering, especially Ralph, Allison, Joe, Dennis, Len, Christopher, Brad, Ron, Carol, Doug, and Donna, Joan, Sandy, Owen, Wendell, Merlin, Jolene, and President Willie. Pray for our homebound, Marcy, Dan, Lenore, Paul, Dolores, Merlin, and Pauline. And we pray for the mission work of the church, especially that of a gathering place at Sheboygan Falls. For all this, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I thank you, my heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger, and I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings in life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul, and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. All right, that's our congregation of prayer for today, Thursday, January 4th, 2024. It's good to have you with us here and uh, come to you each morning at about 9 a.m. Sometimes, though, uh, the internet drops out, and so uh, uh, I'll be posting this later, in the, and that will be you'll be able to hear the very end of it. All right. So God be with you all. Keep you safe. And we'll see you again in the morning.